Okay, we're back. We're live in the 3 p.m. block. Uh, this is Energy in America. And uh, Lou Pugliarisi has put us in touch with Emily Medina of ePrink, and we are so happy to have her on the show. Hi, Emily. Welcome to the show. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're going to talk today about something that you are familiar with as a member of ePrink, and that is uh, energy from and with Mexico. Um, and let me, let me uh, just say some things that I learned about Mexico recently from talking to our uh, correspondent, our host, um, Carlos Suarez. Um, and, um, you know, he was talking about what, what's going on in Mexico vis-a-vis -vis all this, these agreements that Mr. Trump has suggested we have made or he has made, whether in public or in secret. Um, and um, that's got to have an effect according to Carlos, on our relationship with Mexico, because, uh, you know, this country is intimidating Mexico. I suppose it has always intimidated Mexico to a certain extent. Um, but, you know, the, the fact is that we need a good foreign policy with Mexico. We need to be friendly with Mexico. Mex Mexico is an important neighbor, just like Canada. And we need to help build Mexico and help trade with Mexico and, and have a very robust economic relationship and social relationship and diplomatic relationship with Mexico, which we seem to have been, we've lost sight of that recently. So uh, you were going to talk to us about energy in Mexico. And I recall, I think from Lou, that it goes both ways. We sell energy to Mexico and Mexico sells energy to us. Can you describe how that works, Emily? Sure. Yes. So Mexico and U.S., um have a very strong trade relationship in across um, many sectors of their economy if we look at mexico's relationship with the us in the energy sector we can see that the relationship is in both ways so mexico right now imports 60% of its natural gas from the US. So this is a huge quantity of gas that flows from the US to Mexico. And it helps power um, our homes and it helps manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing industry and it helps Mexico's economy overall. Because we are able to to receive affordable energy prices from the U.S. Mm -hmm. Right now, Mexico's energy production um, has it's on decline. Um, Pemex hasn't been able to produce natural gas and oil at the rates that it was producing in the past. Why is that? So what is happening? Um, well. So it's um, the reason for the decline in Pemex oil and natural gas production is due to the fact that Mexico um, had a monopoly over its energy sector for 80 years. So um, by having this monopoly, Pemex was the, the only competitor in Mexico's energy industry. This led to a lack in on investments on Mexico's energy infrastructure. It led to a lack of innovation and competitiveness. So the Pemex monopoly was in place since 1938. Oh, wow. and that's, so that wasn't was, about gas, so that was about oil, right? It was about uh, oil and gas since the production of oil uh, helps Mexico get associated gas. Okay. However, the gas that we receive from the United States, it's different in its composition and it allows us to inject it into CFE's power plants, which help power um, uh, and help meet all of Mexico's electricity demand. So we, we sell power plant type fuel to Mexico, uh, but it's not the same product that Mexico sells to us, right? 
Yes, it's not the same product. Um, so Mexico mainly exports crude oil to the U.S. This benefits um, U.S. Um, the U.S. energy industry because it allows their refineries to operate at an optimal capacity rate. Without the U.S. crude, I mean, without the Mexican crude, it would be harder for the U.S. to maintain uh, the, capa the optimal capacity rates for its refining um, industry. Okay, but now, now Mexico, is, Mexico um, is not able to um, uh, produce that gas at, at, a, at a favorable rate. So what happens when the, the cost of uh, producing that oil and gas or export to the United States goes up? What happens when the price goes up? Um, could you repeat that question? What happens when the price of the oil and gas products that, the, that Mexico sells to the U, U.S. increases? What kind of problems does that create? Well, it creates um, a lack of market for the Mexico's energy, um, energy product. However, given the decline in Mexico's energy product, it is mainly being absorbed by Mexico in and of itself. So this means that Mexico, on one hand, has a declining energy capacity and energy production, and at the same time, it has a growing demand. So we are not being able to, um, to produce at the rate that we are consuming. And that's why the energy trade with the U.S. is so important for Mexico. Because right now we are dependent on the U.S. to satisfy 60% of our natural gas demand. Mm. Is, the, uh, is, is America, are the American prices better than you could get in Mexico? Yes, um, definitely. Um, the U.S. shell revolution has caused and, and uh, natural gas prices in particularly in the Permian Basin to at some time in, in some points become negative prices. So when this happens, Mexico is uh, definitely the primary market um, of the U.S. and shale gas production. Mm. So the problem used to be um, that Mexico wasn't able to absorb as much U.S. natural gas as, as it would have uh, liked to. Because um, although there's an increasing demand growing at 3%, electricity demand going at, growing at 3% annually, um, the decline in production in Mexico like I said, is not able to feed that demand. So, um, so it's sort of like a win-win with the, in terms of the relationship with the U.S. and Mexico, because the U.S. is producing increasing amounts of shell gas, um, and it is having trouble getting its product to market. And the main reason, or one of the main reasons, is that its LNG infrastructure is still under construction, and it won't be until mid twenties, mid um, the the mid, um, so like around twenty twenty five, that we're going to see uh, more LNG exports from the U.S. to other continents and other countries. So right now, the benefit that Mexico has in getting access to, as you can say, cheap and affordable, cheap and clean natural gas is that it is able to, um, to get most of this um, natural gas through pipelines. So Mexico has increased its pipeline capacity over the last years. Um, it's double its, its capacity intake. And this allows larger quantities of natural gas to be able to um, be distributed throughout Mexico. Mm. So uh, what so does this mean no in terms of the, the consumer? Uh, my uh, utility bill, which is presumably done with um, 
you know, um, uh, quantities of American gas product. Um, is it going up? Is it going down? My, if I have a business, how am I affected? Um, if I'm buying gas directly, how am I affected? If you're buying gas directly in the U.S., right? No, in Mexico. In Mexico. In Mexico. So if you're buying gas in Mexico, uh, definitely um, with larger imports of natural gas from the U.S., there's a price reduction in our electricity bill. And there's a perfect example of how lack of natural gas in some areas of Mexico lead to higher electricity prices in comparison to the states in the north who are able to, to absorb larger quantities of natural gas because of the geographic proximity to the U.S. Mm. So... Some areas in the south of Mexico, for example, Yucatan, have a harder time getting access to natural gas from the U.S. because the, there's not the infrastructure that you have in other areas of the country. Um, however, the, there's been increased efforts um, since, the, uh, the, since the energy reform was passed to actually build that infrastructure that is needed to flow natural, natural gas from the U.S. to the southern, to southern Mexico. And so, well, Emily, when you talk about infrastructure, I guess you're talking about gas pipelines. <clears throat> I guess there must be natural gas pipelines running, running across the, uh, the border between the U.S. and Mexico. And I guess there must be gas pipelines running all the way from north to south in Mexico. Am I right? Yes, exactly. Um, so there's, there was a lot of um, government um, efforts to increase the, uh, the infrastructure capacity that goes and that connects the U.S. to Mexico. So those cross-border pipelines were the first in place. And the other areas of the country are still being, um, the, the other infrastructure throughout the country is still being built out as of today. Actually, yesterday, there was just an announcement that the pipeline that goes from Texas to Tuxpan, Veracruz, was um, just constructed and final, final, finalized construction after an eight-month delay. Mm -hmm. So this pipeline was built between Genova and TransCanada. And the fact that it's now built is uh, great, speaks to the success of the energy reform. And we definitely are going to need more of these types of projects to be I, able to distribute natural gas throughout the country more efficiently. I, I, I take it that, um, you know, where, where this goes is that, um, that uh, Mexico needs um, natural gas from the United States. And Mexico ideally would like to sell more product to the United States, except it's, it's, it's got a problem in uh, being able to generate, to produce uh, enough yeah. to meet that need at a, at a reasonable price. So I have two questions that flow from that. One is, uh, uh, what, what is Mexico, what can Mexico do, what is it doing about um, dealing with this, uh, you know, monopoly problem you described in order to generate more gas and oil to sell to the U.S.? Because it sounds like that would be in Mexico's best interest to do that. Um, that means funding other oil and gas companies, uh, recapitalizing them somehow supporting them and giving them incentives uh, to uh, create competition in the marketplace. Uh, I don't know, what, what can be done? And what is the Mexican government doing uh, to permit this to flow, flow freely? Absolutely. Um, so Mexico's energy reform was passed in, in 2013, and it was intended to enhance Mexico's energy model to promote energy security throughout the country and to incentivize private sector participation for the purpose of boosting energy production in the country. Mm -hmm. So this energy reform 
right now has taken a turn in direction with the new administration. So Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador um, has a very different view from the previous uh, administration. He's not doing it then. Um, he is has not laid a solid energy policy as of today. Mm. And he's been in office for six months. Mm. So he's stopped and canceled the, the oil auctions as well as, and he's also banned um, fracking in the country. Mm. Does so, he have a good reason for that? I mean, it sounds like it's, it's, uh, it's, off, it's off policy. Uh, what, what is his justification for that? So AMLO's um, agenda follows um, the ideological approach to energy sovereignty. So although he um, has a clear agenda for doing, uh, for making Mexico almost great again, like the slogan oh, used in the oh, U.S. Oh, that phrase tears my heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> but um, so although he has this energy sovereignty view and he wants to make Mexico energy self-sufficient in a way, there's still not a direct plan as to how to achieve that goal. So he, one of his only policies or um, few policies in energy is to, be, to build an $8 billion refinery in his home state of Tabasco. So for me, what I'm getting out of his- Did you say in energy, his county, in his county? Yes. So he's, yeah. It sounds like slightly corrupt, but that's just my reaction. Yeah. And, and the way that the project has been carried out has been, it's raised a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Given that the companies who are specialized in building refineries held an assessment that took into account the timeline that the government set for the build the build out of this refinery and the and the amount of and the costs and it's very the what the specialized companies are saying is very different from what the government is saying mm. that well this so, certainly it complicates an already complicated situation because you know you have yeah. the, the the problem uh, that the legislation a few years ago was intended to to uh, resolve, but it didn't get resolved. Uh, and then you have the problems that uh, Trump is creating with his threats of tariff and his uh, demands on Mexico, which are unrealistic at the, at the, at the kindest. Um, and um, what, I, what I get out of this is that Mexico has a, a pretty hard road to hoe here in order to get to an optimal situation. And then on top of that, we have, we have these tariff threats and uh, these uh, um, uh, meaningless, uh, uh, undiplomatic exercises going on between the United States and, and Mexico. How, how are we going to get to a good place here? How are we going to get to that model that you spoke of earlier about, you know, both, both countries are selling uh, energy to the other? Um, uh, there may be different products, but there's an exchange there. And it's the way things should be between neighbors. That's the way, but we, we, it sounds like there are obstacles to getting there. Uh, how, you know, am I right? And can we get there? What do we do? Yeah, no, exactly. And I think, I mean, the opening of the energy, uh, energy sector in Mexico was a huge step for Mexico and a huge step in the right direction in order to integrate the U.S. and Mexico's energy sectors more tightly. So, I mean, right now, the, the best approach would be for the current government, for AMLO, to continue the policies and continue the, the projects that, and the policy framework that was established on the energy reform. So instead of dismantling it, to, and instead of um, increasing the control of CFE, the utility state owned company and Pemex who used to both be 
um, the state monopolies of Mexico's energy sector. So instead of giving power to those old monopolies, to break the monopolies and to allow for foreign direct investment and to allow for the private sector participation that is needed to better and more efficiently integrate both Mexico's and US energy sectors. So I think this is, um, it's not all bad. I mean, I think Mexico um, right now is going through a little, it took a step back with the current administration, but I think that what happened after the energy reform is not going to go away with the current and the, in, in, in the next, six years. Mm. I think it's going to slow the pace with the current administration, but I think the the foundation is there for more cooperation between for more cooperation to happen between both the US and Mexico's energy sectors. When, when is the president's matter, when is the will. president's uh, term up? How long how long is he in office? You said he's been six months already. Uh, how, when is it when is it when does yeah. it terminate? And the term um, is last six years. Oh, six years. So, oh. yeah, it's it's a little bit longer than the U.S. Yeah. But and there's not a possibility for re-election in Mexico. Oh, you just serve one term. That's it. Yes. Mm, well, we ought to adopt something like that here, I think. Uh, but that's just my thought. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. So now if you, you know, th that Trump has uh, threatened and, and he hasn't taken it off the table, um, uh, a, a tariff of 5% to 25%. Does, do you know if that tariff or that, that array of tariffs that he is threatening uh, includes tariff on, on energy products? I believe so. I believe it includes all products. Um, there wasn't many specificities on the, the, the political um, debate around this tariffs, but it, it, I believe it, it, it encompasses all, mm. of, all of the, the U.S. imports and exports between Mexico and okay, the U.S. Well, that, that sounds, that's However, consistent, but I wonder, you know, if he does that, you know, if he decides that Mexico is not making um, enough um, effort mm -hmm. to stop uh, migrants at the border and people sinking sanctuary and the like, um, mm -hmm. it, with, uh, you know, the, the new uh, police force that Mexico is establishing for that purpose. If Trump doesn't like uh, what Mexico is doing, then he will, uh, he will impose tariffs. And if he imposes tariffs and, and they cover uh, oil and gas products from Mexico to the United States. What is the effect of that? Of course, American buyers and consumers uh, will be taxed. I mean, that's, that's the, the obvious uh, result um, that American buyers and consumers will, will pay for the cost of the tariffs. But there's probably a, a secondary effect also. How, how would that affect Mexico if Trump imposed uh, these 5 to 25 percent tariffs on Mexican uh, energy products. Okay, so if we look at the natural gas sector for a minute, so it would affect both the U.S. and Mexico. So the U.S. exporters of natural gas need a market for their product. Otherwise, the product runs on negative prices because of the abundance of production that we've seen over the last decade on shale gas production. So without Mexico as a market, um, the US gas prices are affected. At the same time, Mexico um, is affected because it does not have access to cheap and affordable natural gas. Like I said before, Mexico depends on the US for 60% of its natural gas imports. So if we have tariffs on natural gas, then our, um, our whole economy um, is affected. Um, and not only Mexico's economy, and because of the nature of the U.S. and Mexico trade relationship, both the U.S. and Mexico's economy will be affected. Because, mm -hmm. for example, car manufacturers 
um, right now um, are benefiting from affordable natural gas prices from the US. So if the Mexican manufacturing, manufacturing industry does not have the same access from, from the, for, for natural gas from the US, it will have to look other places to satisfy that demand. And, um, and this would be a lost of opportunity for, for integration and for logistical, or the logistical benefits that exist from having um, a, an, an integrated natural gas market between the US and Mexico. Mm. Is Mexico threatening Trump with tariffs on American products? So, I, haven't heard, I um, haven't heard it, if it is, you know. Um, so right now, Mexico is quite vulnerable on the energy side. Um, it does not have much power to leverage with the U.S. when it comes to energy um, because we don't have the same productions as we did in the past. Um, we, although we have abundant oil and gas resources and reserves, um, we are not producing as much. So mm -hmm. we don't have that much leverage as we did before mm -hmm. on that side. However, our economy, I think, is the one that, that saves us from, from, ha from, ha from having and from leveraging natural gas from the US. Because, for example, international car manufacturers like Ford and other companies establish their factories in Mexico, and they um, they are they they bring foreign direct investment to Mexico and create jobs, but their integrated supply chains with the U.S. helps them compete better by well, having it's, access to Mexico. It's, it's clearly, uh, you know, it has secondary effect if you start. Um, if you start bullying your neighbor on one thing before you know it, uh, things happen which you don't anticipate. And that certainly the automobile supply chain would be part of that. Um, you know, and, and I think this is very disruptive what he's doing. And if I asked you, Emily, uh, your advice that you would give to this administration, this American administration, you'd probably, you'd probably tell me um, he should stop bullying Mexico because it doesn't work for anybody's benefit, and it's very disruptive uh, over the short term and the long term. Um, am I right? Yes, absolutely. And those um, that rhetoric, rhetoric does not really um, have any positive outcome, either for for the U.S. consumer or for the Mexican consumer. Who are the? Are the I mean, if you want. Um, to have a trade war with an ally like Mexico, then you have to really think about the consequences that it would have on your own country. Yes, oh, I totally agree. And you know, I, I, I'd like to, to end with a, a positive thought. Would you like to hear my positive thought? There is a positive side. Is that yeah, absolutely. Most, most people, you know, haven't been thinking about our relations with Mexico. Oh, they, you know, they might know some Mexicans. They might employ Mexicans. I mean, Mexicans are all over the U.S., right? Everywhere. Um, they're part of our culture. They're part of our workforce. They're, they're part of our country. And they've been that way since 1850 or before. So, you know, but, but what people haven't been thinking about, and this is really worth thinking about now, is our relationship with modern day Mexico about the, the supply chain for cars, about the, about the fuel, the oil and the gas that's moving across the border, um, about Mexico as, a, as our neighbor, uh, as a, a long term friend. Um, people haven't been thinking about that. They just sort of, you know, they just, it's not at the top of consciousness, that's all. This ridiculous um, bullying that's going on now. Uh, actually makes a lot of people, don't you agree, in this country, more conscious of Mexico. And, and actually, you know, you, you always kind of side with the victim in a bullying episode. I, I know yeah. I do. <laughs> so I, yeah. think, I think a lot of people 
are going to say, wait a minute, you know, I need to know more about Mexico. I need to I need to find out how we can have a wonderful long term relationship. There are friends, there are relatives, there there are there are partners in so many ways. So actually, at the end of the day, Emily, I hope it's I hope the the end of this administration happens quickly. But at the end of the day, yeah. we probably will have a better, warmer relationship with Mexico than we had before. Don't you think so? Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I, I really hope that. I mean, that's a very positive and optimistic note because um, I think people in Mexico are also a little bit, um, I mean, uh, threatened, feel a little bit threatened by, by the US, who has been a historic friend and a well, historic That's regrettable. Ally. Yeah. So, we want I them mean, to think I, well of us and we want to think <laughs> well of them and we want to have a you know, a familial relationship, if you will, which we really have. We just, we have to focus on it. Well, Emily, Emily Medina, thank you so much for joining us today and helping us with these things. Very complex uh, in many ways. And I'm so glad you were able to help us. And I, I hope we can do a show with you again in the near future. Thank you so yeah, much, Emily. Yeah, that'd be Emily. great. Thank Aloha. you. Aloha. Aloha. Bye-bye.